Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments on bicycle travel adventures. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 345, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net or text me at 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 345th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name's Tim Mooney. Thanks so much for joining. On this edition of the Pedal Shift Project, we welcome e-bike expert. I don't know if he'd call himself an expert, but I'm going to call him an expert. Biking Brian to chat about his e-bike touring and adventures, and he's got a ton of them. We discuss his background in cycling, in touring, and all of his experience with building e-bikes and battery packs and the future potential for e-bike travel. I cannot tell you how excited I am to bring you this conversation. It was fun. It was interesting. It was nerdy. We got a little bit into the tech of things, but this is all super, super accessible to even those of you who do not know what a Volt is. It is a question I asked. Quick thing before we get started. On a few occasions in our discussion, Brian mistakenly referred to one type of system for e-bike versus the one that he was actually talking about. So let me just give a quick overview here. There are two types of systems. One, which is a hub-based system where the motor essentially is on one of the wheels. Usually it's on the back. The other type, the one that Brian actually is using in his more recent trips, and he describes it a little bit more, is called a mid-drive system. And that is hooked up in the bottom bracket. He'll go into it a little bit more. However, because he ended up saying hub when he meant mid-drive a couple of times, we're going to drop in this. Mid-drive. So you'll hear my voice when it gets dropped in. Don't be alarmed. It was just kind of cleaning things up to make it a little bit less confusing. The conversation's amazing. I can't wait to share it with you starting now. Today, we have a special treat on the Pebble Shift Project. We are joined by Biking Brian. Brian, thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate you being on the show today. Hi, Tim. Really excited to, to be on the show today. Awesome. Well, we are talking today because you do something that I think is, as, as the old adage goes, Wayne Gretzky scored a lot of goals because he didn't skate to where the puck was. He skated to where the puck it was going to be. And I feel like you are skating very much where the puck is going to be around e-bikes and using them in the bicycle travel, the touring, however, whatever label we want to put on it in that context. So I, I want to talk so much about what you do. Everybody absolutely go check out Biking Brian on his YouTube channel. Just search for Biking Brian on YouTube. That is the way to do it. But before we dive into e-biking and what you've done and how you've built your bike and all of the different adventures you've gone on, I would love to know a little bit more about your background in both bicycling from a young age or whatever and how you got into touring too. Yeah, definitely. I started very, very early. My dad, when he was in college, got into cycling and joined like a local club and stuff like that. And when I was only two years old, he took me on my first tour across Illinois. We did a lot of organized rides in Illinois, mostly bike tours. They were a week long, one of them being the across Illinois bike ride. That was the first one I went out when I was two years old. And it sort of escalated for there. I, he was pulling me in one of those like Two, those buggies that you pull behind your bike for kids. And then we converted to a tandem. And since I was short when I was a kid, I couldn't reach the pedals in the tandem. So we actually cut off the bottom bracket on an old bike and then mounted it higher up and ran the chain there. So for, for some time after I graduated out of the buggy, I was pedaling behind him on, on the tandem as we were doing tours. And we did not only the organized tours, but we also did some camping ones where we then reused the buggy, threw a bunch of camping gear in it, and we went up like the Mississippi River up to Minnesota and back down through Iowa. And then at the uh, age of 10, I graduated to my own 10 speed and we, we were still doing kind of the same thing. We were doing a lot of organized uh, tours in the summer and I was riding my own 10 speed. And I can kind of continue doing that till once I got out of high school, I kind of was more focused on my career and kind of stopped riding. Now I do stuff around town, but not, not a lot of touring. And it wasn't until maybe 10, 15 years ago, me and my friends would always do a, a yearly like extended weekend camping trip. And it sort of morphed into 
a four day bike trips. And then I kind of got into it. It escalated from there. And uh, yeah, next thing I knew I was in 2016, I biked from where I'm at outside of Chicago to Denver. My buddy came out on the train and then we rode all the way almost to within a hundred miles of the Utah border. So it really escalated quickly once we started doing those weekend trips. So that's kind of, I built a bike touring bike then in 2017, because I was on an old aluminum Schwinn that my dad had handed down to me and kind of went from there. That's when I started the YouTube channel was on my Denver trip out West. And the video quality is not the best because I was just recording on my phone and didn't know too much back then, but I'm still like, Slowly progressed and got better gear. Like I got a GoPro and things like that. But yeah, that's uh, pretty much where it started very early and kind of how it's transformed until today. So it sounds like you've got quite a bit of a background in in constructing and building bikes. Did that? And it sounds like it came from your dad as well. Do you have like an engineering background or anything like that? No, I'm I'm into computers and electronics, but I've always kind of been mechanically inclined. I've worked on cars, also electronically, not just mechanically, but doing car stereos and alarms and stuff like that. Just never never professionally, but just as a kind of playing around. I've always kind of messed around with the electronics and always fix my own bike, my own car, that kind of thing. So Interesting. My dad's an electrical engineer and designed photocopiers for Xerox for all these years. So it has been around me so much, which is why the whole concept of batteries and electricity and stuff like that has been sort of exposed to me. But I, of course, walked a slightly different path and became a lawyer. So (laughs) yeah, yeah. but I did I did soak up enough by osmosis that I think that that this might be something that I could kind of like, you know, wrap my hands around, which is why I was been so attracted to the content that you put out on your YouTube channel, what got you into e-bikes? Like what, what was the thing that sort of jumped off? Was it just your interest in computers and electronics or was there something else? Uh, Yeah. So lucky for me, my, my work is only like seven or eight miles from my house. And what I did is I had gotten a bike for like my 16th birthday. It was an old like nineties Trek. And I converted it over to a commuting bike. So I put nice trekking bars on it and kind of changed the gear ratios, put road tires on it. And I was commuting to work. And luckily for me, we have showers at work, but you know, I was arriving there like soaking wet in the summertime because there's some hills I had to climb and all that. And then that's kind of, I I was wondering, is there a a better way to do this? And I started looking around and I saw the e-bikes were out there. So I said, Hey, I'm going to try and build an e-bike. And that'll help me like not have to climb those hills as hard, not have to push as hard in the summertime. And then I won't get to work sweaty and tired and exhausted. So I ended up uh, taking that same commuter bike and I got what they call, I think the brand is like uh, Magic Pie and it's a hub motor and it's built with the 26 inch rim on it and everything. So basically you just attach it to your bicycle you take your old wheel out, put this new one in. And then it's got just like a little, all it had was a throttle. There was no pedal assist. So pedal assist is like a sensor for RPM. So when you're pedaling, it increases the the motor turns faster. So this just had a throttle. So you would just kind of pedal and push the throttle down. So I got that set up. I got a, I bought just a 10 amp hour battery for it and had the magic pie. And then I was riding that to work and it was absolutely great. That, you know, the things that I was looking for, not to arrive all sweaty at work and exhausted and tired. And I loved riding it so much. I rode it around town everywhere. It was, it was just the greatest thing. I, I was like ex- excited looking for excuses to go ride this bike around because it was just so much fun to ride. So I used that for a couple of years. And then unfortunately, the bike trail that I would ride in part of the way to work was, was fully submerged and I really didn't want to turn around. It was like I had to have to go back two or three miles. And so I rode through it with the magic pie and I didn't realize how deep it was. And it got basically fully submerged. And that was the end of the, the magic pie mm-hmm. hub motor. Water so, plus electronics do, do not make yeah, it typically. Yeah. Not so good. Not so good at all. I tried to fix it, but it just wasn't working. So at that point, I knew I, I, I really enjoyed the e-bike. So I still had the battery. So I went out and I did some more research and I found out about the mid drive. So those are basically, you take out the guts of the bottom bracket on the bicycle and those mount through there. The advantage to that over the rear hub is you now have the mechanical advantage of your derailleur and all the gears in the back. 
So basically, instead of the free wheel being on the back like it normally is, it adds a second free wheel in the front so that when you coast, the, the mid drive motor is, is coasting or, and the motor is still spinning. So I graduated to that and that allowed me to do the pedal assist. So it has the sensors in it. Basically, the higher RPM that you spin, the more power it puts down. And it's, it's, it's programmable. You can, uh, in their little app and their firmware, you can adjust like the ramp time and all that kind of nitty gritty details of it. But it's a much better experience just having to set the assist level, how much power it's giving you, and then just pedal like you would a normal bike. How how tricky was that to install? Because that strikes me, once you're talking about tearing up bottom brackets and stuff like that, that feels like that you've got to have some kind of degree of bike wrenching knowledge to do, or was it easy? Yeah, actually it was fair, fairly easy. So the it fits the older, like I forgot the technical name of it, but like the, the screw in bottom brackets that have the, the locking nut or whatever on the side. You basically just remove the old one. And this one slides in from one side with the motor and everything attached. And then you literally just screw the, the, like the locking nut on the other end of it. And that's Interesting. it. So a pretty standard bottom bracket. This'll just work. Just bolts right into to your standard bike. And they, it comes with like a little bike computer controller. And that allows you to set like the assist levels. They're usually like one through five or one through 10, giving you more power as you go higher up. And then it comes with the kit usually comes with brakes because they have little micro switches. So when you squeeze the brake, it stops the motor. So if for some reason you have your throttle on or something like that, if you just grab the brakes, you're, you're killing everything. So, so that's, that's kind of nice. So it's, it's, so it's got a bunch of different, I'll use the incorrect terms here. Cause again, lawyer, not engineer, it's got a bunch of leads that basically go to these various places to signal the motor to either be going or not going. It sounds like. Yeah, so it has basically a speed sensor, just like your normal bike computer would. Then it has wires that go to the the handbrakes for the for the kill switches, and then one set of wires goes to your battery, and one that goes to the little little bike computer. And usually, they come with either a thr- a thumb or a grip throttle. Um, so it's fairly straightforward. You're literally just plugging things in. It's like you can screw on handlebars and take them off. You can do this. You're just basically zip tying them to your bike or, or, yeah. or taping them up. But it's a fairly straightforward. They've, there's a, a lot of good videos online on, on doing that too. It's not quite as simple as the hub motor, but it's still still fairly easy. If you're comfortable working on your bike, I, I think that's a, a fairly easy would, upgrade. Would you say that If someone was really interested in doing this, would you recommend that you jump straight to this version or would you recommend starting off with the hub version first? I'm just curious what your take is. I know the the hub motors have have sort of advanced. Now they do have sensors and things like that that you can attach for the pedal assist. But I really still like the advantage of the the mid drive motor instead. And one of those things, especially regarding touring or anything like that, that hub motor You've got the wires coming out of the the back of it because the motor is inside, literally inside the hub, and usually they're they're not quick release; they're mm-hmm. bolted on, and so it makes it a little bit difficult if you have a flat tire. It's it's a little bit more to work on to get the bike off. You got to carry some extra tools with you for that, and just getting that wire and everything finagled. And I know I fought with mine a few times when I had flat tires, and just the mechanical advantage of the gearing is very nice too in the the mid drive interesting that's all really interesting now the other thing you mentioned that i is probably worth adding in here is there are a variety of different types of e-bikes out there but uh, the the controlling element of the whole thing is often throttle versus pedal assist your rig has both is that correct yeah and most of the kits that come out have both and i'm an advocate i i i have no shame in using the throttle but i'm also not like tooling around like a motorcycle or a moped either just on the throttle it is kind of nice like if you're say you're on an incline or something you're taking off from a stoplight and you want to get across the intersection it's nice to be able to give a little boost i've even used it i've had dogs chase me and i just it's hit the throttle to 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 go a little faster and, and get away from that situation one big thing too when i'm cruising or coasting like my whole thing on the e-bike is we'll probably get into later 
um, going long distances is maintaining that speed too. I want to do that 18, 20 miles an hour. And when I coast, if I coast, I'm going to immediately slow down to like 10, eight miles an hour. So I will use the throttle and just kind of maintain my speed while I'm coasting or, or resting a little bit and then just oh, that's, gain and, and keep pedaling. That's interesting technique then. Yeah. So that, so you're not going to be pedaling every single square inch of the whole thing. So when you do need to coast or want to coast, you've got the throttle to maintain that speed. That makes sense. Yes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about more about your build because I I'm super fascinated with it. You went with, I think a 52 volt battery setup, which is larger than I think that you would see mostly in a lot of the commercially available e-bikes that are out there. Why did you go with 52 volts? Also, what's a volt? <laughs> well, without getting into the, the technical details of it, the, regarding the e-bike with the voltage, the higher voltage you have, the more power is available and the higher RPM the actual motor is going to spin. So basically that going from 48 to 52 volts pretty, I would say 99% of all the mo hub motors, the uh, mid-drive motors that are 48 volt, their electronics are good usually to about 60 volts. Oh, nice. So you're typically safe running those, the higher 52 volt battery because they're safe. They, when they're fully charged, they're like 58.8 or something like that. So you're well within that, that range. You've got a little bit extra power if you need it for climbing the hills, if you've got a headwind. But the advantage is too, if you don't use that extra power, it's just gaining you more, you've got more gas in the tank, you can go further distance. So you can get a longer range out of it. So you, it's, it's got multiple benefits to it. The, the only real disadvantage is, obviously if your bike doesn't support it, but most do, the only disadvantage is it's a little bit larger. But you know, if you went with a larger capacity 48 volt battery, it's going to be a little heavier too, or a little bigger as well. Right. That was sort of like the sweet spot that you determined when you were kind of looking at all of these things. Yes. A little bit more about your charger, because if, for, for, again, folks, if you want to check it out, check out Brian's YouTube channel, because he he shows all of this. But you've promised, I think, a spec video, but I'm not sure if I've seen it yet. So I have. Uh, and I, I've done some recordings, but I, I just have not. It's hard to sit down and just go through everything because I forget about something. I want to re-record things. So I, I promise I'm going to get one out there. Awesome. Um, awesome. We're all looking forward to it. But yeah, talk a little bit more about that charger, though. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, I'll, I'll take a little step back. And when I started, it basically, it was during the pandemic. I was looking at Hey, I want to, I love these bike tours, but typically I, I can only take like a week off of vacation for work. I can only, I'm only allowed a certain range because of that on my regular acoustic bike. So one of the things I was looking at with this e-bike, I was, my old battery was kind of wearing down. It only had like a 20 mile range. So I was looking to go with a larger capacity battery. And then I started thinking about this e-bike touring thing. And one of the goals I had was, hey, what if I can do two to three times the distance I would do on a regular bike on this e-bike and cover more ground? So I could basically have like a three week long bike tour as far as distance goes over the course of just one week. So one of those things is I had to be able to charge fast because during the day, I mean, I, the pa the battery pack I built is good, just in perfect conditions for like probably right around 150 miles, but there's never perfect conditions. So one of the things in order to do that two to three uh, times a regular touring, just so instead of doing 55 miles and doing 100 or 150 is to be able to charge fast. And when you've got a smaller battery pack, you can't charge them fast. They have a thing that's called a, a C level. And it's both like discharge and charge. Like the normal kind of accepted range is 20%. You don't want to charge faster than 20% of the capacity of the battery. So keeping that in mind, if you have, let's say like a 15 amp hour battery pack, the safe charging for that is about, about three amps. So if you're charging at three amps for one hour, that's only going to get you like eight or nine extra miles. Right. So building a larger battery pack, I'm able to have a higher amperage to charge the battery. So the C level is much higher. It, uh, my 50 amp hour battery pack, I can safely charge at 10 amps. So that's a lot more than, than three amps. And then you can go a little over that. So basically 
I got a fast charger that does 15 amps. So that's a little over the accepted safe level. And by safe, I just mean it's not going to do damage to the batteries or things like that. But if you only do it every once in a while, it's not a big deal. So I got a 15 amp uh, battery charger, and that's a little higher than the, the accepted 20%, but I only do that during the day for, for a quick charge for an hour or two. And basically by charging at that higher level, I'm able to get at 15 amps, I'm able to get another about 45 miles of distance for one hour of charging. So when I'm riding during the day, about the 60 to 80 mile mark, I start looking for a place. It's usually time to get off the bike anyway, even <laughs> sitting on sure. it for a couple hours. So I always look for a place to charge. And I don't like doing it at commercial places or things like that. Like I don't, I try not to plug in at like a gas station, take out their ice machine or something like that, because it is a, a higher, a higher wattage charger. So I usually look for like uh, city parks and things like that. So I'll stop somewhere. And because I have the luxury of being able to go another 20 miles, no big deal. I won't stop if I need to chart unless there are outlets there. Because if I'm going to spend an hour eating lunch or resting, I'm, I want to make sure that I'm charging. Yeah. So with that 15 amp hour battery or the 15 amp charger, I'm able to get those 45 miles and I can just sit there, relax, have my launch, et cetera, and, and gain some more mileage for the day. And it's a pretty good size. It looks like it's about the size of maybe a couple of bricks side by side together. Standard, standard bricks. Is that about right? Uh, yeah, it's basically, I have 17, I think it's a 17 liter pannier in the front mm -hmm. and that's what it goes into. And it literally fits the entire thing. So what, so during the pandemic, when I was researching this and deciding like, hey, what, what, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get a larger capacity battery? I looked around and some places had larger ones like 30 amp hour, 25 amp hour, et cetera. But no one had a really large one where I could do that fast charging. So I actually ended up finding a book online. And I think they also have uh, YouTube and uh, videos and stuff like that. But it was like DIY lithium batteries. Huh. And that's real, where I really learned everything about like how to arrange them in series, et cetera, and parallel and how to build them, how to weld, how to test them, mm -hmm. like the voltage and all that. So I researched that and I ended up finding <clears throat> typically e-bike batteries use those like 18650 lithium ion cells and they're great. They work, they work good, but their capacity, you can only get a like 3,500 milliamp is the largest capacity cell. Yeah, so think about like your, that. your phone charger kind of in, ter in terms of capacity or yeah. a phone battery bank. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I found out that they had kind of just come out on the market. They're called 21700 cells and they're the ones that Tesla switched to. Mm -hmm. And they're only slightly larger, but the capacity of them was five amp hours. So I could build a larger capacity battery pack with those little bit larger cells and not have to have as many batteries in there and make it a little actually ended up being a little smaller than it would be uh, with those smaller cells. So I ended up getting like after reading the book and everything, I got a little tiny Arduino like spot welder that connects to an RC battery pack, some strips and nickel. And I just started putting these things together and testing everything out. And they have these little tiny like plastic brackets that you can slide the batteries to and sort of interlock them together like Legos. Right. So that's literally what I did. I put the batteries in these little like plastic Lego pieces, took the nickel strip and my little RC car battery in the spot welder and welded the cells together from what I had learned and then wrapped it in shrink wrap. So and if it. this all sounds really complex, I, it, it, but you're intrigued, everybody just Google this and go into YouTube because there's a ton of different battery production where folks will buy these cells that Brian was just talking about that used they're they're, 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 well, they're used. They're not spent because most of them are often very good. They break apart these things, get to those individual cells, and then they rebuild these larger packs doing exactly what Brian just described with the welder and the nickel and all this other stuff. And it, Legos is exactly the right way of putting it. It looks like a big Lego project. Yeah. And these individual cells I got are actually brand new. Yet you can definitely go the used route and get those. I know there's a couple online re retailers that do that, but these are actually brand new cells from uh, just a, a website that sells batteries. Yeah. It's just, they happen to be the exact same that Tesla uses in their 
in their model. I think the reason why I mentioned the used one is because I there's a guy that was building an electric VW or something like that. Basically, yeah. Was, creating a, a, t- a basically trying to create his own tesla battery or reconditioned tesla batteries and was able to kind of put in these new cells to do it it's awesome to think that we can do that for a bicycle though yes yeah yeah i know exactly what you're talking about what what channel that is but yeah it's the british guy with the with the hair right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that, that guy i can't, can't remember the dude's name but he's interesting i i i love how you talk about analog bikes that by the way that is just i think that i'm going to start using that for all non-electrical bikes because i just love the name of it how do you feel you mentioned that you'll do 150 mile day on this bike how do you feel physically at compared doing a 150 mile day or like a one of these double days that you're capable of doing on your e-bike versus an analog bike 50 or 60 mile day does the physical output feel about the same or do you still feel fresher? How does that feel typically for you? Yeah, so I mean, it really depends on the individual. But for me, like the the effort that I'm putting in, I'd say the a it's about it's about half. So if I'm doing a hundred miles on my e bike, that's about the same as a day of fifty miles on my regular acoustic bike or right. analog bike. So it definitely depends on the the input that you're putting in. And of course, you've got the luxury when you're on an e-bike that you can take it a little easier, et cetera. But so it all depends on the individual. But yeah, the, the effort I put in, it feels about, I could do about twice the distance on the e-bike and feel the same. So if I do gotcha. a 140 mile day, it feels like a 70 mile day on the touring bike. So and this, this is, you were putting time. an effort. Yeah, yeah. The, these, yes. these rides are not like, oh, you're just hitting the throttle, sitting back and going. You're putting in the same amount of effort that you put in on a typical touring bike day. So, and that was my impression based on watching all of your stuff and, and, and the fact that this was more pedal assist and you were conserving the, the juice that you had in your, your pack. So that, that makes sense, a ton of sense. Is that from your perspective? And I think this is what's been a limiting factor when I've been looking at e-bikes. Because I haven't felt confident enough to kind of jump in and build my own battery and do effectively what you've done. When you're looking at range, tell me if you if you agree with this. I don't think that there are currently available bikes that I've seen that have the range that we need and the power that we need for bike touring type of distances that you could just buy off the rack, I, that, that we're still in a place where you needed to kind of do what you've done and go with the 52 volt, build your own battery pack, have that fast charger. Am I crazy or, or what's, what's your take right now on that? Yeah, I, I think you're, you're, you're definitely right there. There are probably some one-off places that build them, but yeah, off the shelf stuff. And it, it really depends on the distance you want to go because the further that you're going, the faster you need to go to do that with, unless you like riding in the dark, but I don't. So a lot of the commercial available bikes have a little bit lower battery capacity. I have a friend of mine that literally just bought like a store bought e-bike and he got a 15 amp hour battery and then they had some deal. He got a second one and we're planning on probably doing a trip or so next year. And I think it'd be totally doable with that, with just the batteries that came with that. We might probably not going to do charging during the day, but with those two batteries, we should be able to maintain, you know, 16, 18 miles an hour and probably do, you know, 75, 80 miles in a day. Yeah. It's not the hundred, 150. Right. Uh, but the best thing is too, if you start running low, you can conserve and just don't go as fast or worst case you're on an e-bike. If it, you run out of battery, it turns into a bicycle. So. Yeah. And that's a good point because a lot of these bikes are, are, are reasonably decent bikes, even when the e-assist or the battery is done. A lot of them aren't if you're in a lot of the yeah the cities with these. These are tanks that you would not want to be pedaling otherwise. But that's interesting, too, because that's a different use case for an e-bike. That's a traditional distance with somebody. I don't know if they if they would be interested in doing an analog tour at that distance, but maybe not. So somebody who maybe is like, I could do 20 or 30 miles on my own. But with an e-assist and with a couple of, uh, well, now I've already lost, I lost the thread on how big those batteries were. But, you know, if you can pull yeah. it off with a commercially available bike, that might be what's in the realm of possible. Now, if you want to do a biking Brian 200 mile <laughs> urban assault through Cleveland and, and, and get to Buffalo, you're, you're going to have to, you're going to have to rock your own bike or battery building. 
Yeah. And that's not, I wouldn't call it a supper fest, but it's, it's definitely, I'm trying to prove, prove a thing and go a bit further. I, I think the 80 to hundred mile range though is totally doable and would be comfortable and not you, you would enjoy it as opposed to like pushing it further than that. So, and it depends on the individual too. If you're only looking to do 50 miles, but maybe you're, you got knee issues and you're just going to use that assist when you're going up hills. I mean, a smaller battery could last all day. So yeah, it really that's, depends on your goals. I agree. That's the use case that I think that where we're at right now that we can easily hit with commercially available batteries. So if you're interested in doing the kind of bicycle travel that Brian does, or I do, or anybody else that we've ever talked on the show, but don't feel like you can get up the hills or do things like that, this might be something that you could kind of take a look at. But if you want to do something baller like Brian does, you got to learn how to build <laughs> batteries. That's all I have to say. How, how do you handle, you're on a lot of shared paths. You are on main roads. And I think one of the benefits of being able to go 20 miles per hour pretty consistently allows you to kind of be on those roads in a little bit, I don't know, more confident way is how I would put it. But when you're on those shared bike and pedestrian paths, there's usually speed limits on those that'll typically be around the 15 mile per hour range. And even that sometimes might be a little bit fast for the conditions. How do you handle speed on your bike in these types of scenarios? Yeah. So I definitely, when, when the path is only six feet wide or whatever, I definitely slow it down. And I'm, I've been places already like out in Boulder. I ran across bike trails that say just no e-bikes allowed period. And yeah. I, I don't want to be the person that ruins it for other people. And I don't want to be an a-hole either. So I, de when I'm passing people or going, I'm, I'm doing the speed limit and I don't pass people under assist at all. I'll, I'll pedal, maybe do like one or two miles an hour more than they're doing to, to overtake them. But yeah, I, I definitely keep the, the speeds down on the pass. I might go a little faster if there's no one around and it's a clear a line of sight, but you know, I'm not going to be bombing down, fly around people or anything like that. I definitely got, gotcha. I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it for everyone else. And I'm just not that, that type of person. I, I kind of like the idea that I don't want people to know I'm even on an e-bike basically when I'm uh, going by them. Well, that's the thing. Your rig looks like a four pannier, traditional old school touring rig. And the reality is, is you got, you got some stuff under the hood there, man. <laughs> exactly. I think we've already talked about this a little bit, but I'm, I'm curious about your perspective about why someone would get into e-bike touring. We talked about the, the use case where it's somebody where you want to double what you're doing, where you, you can do a 200 mile day, hypo, more than hypothetically, you've done, you've done it. Folks who want to be able to go up hills. Are there any other kind of use cases for e-bike travel that you can think of off the top of your head? Uh, yeah. One of the nice things that I realized right away is it just not even necessarily touring, but just daily bike riding. Like if I'm leaving from my house in the afternoon to go on a ride, I'm usually within a 20 mile radius because that's all I can do on my regular bike in the time allotted. But with the e-bike, it's kind of nice. I can go out 40 miles and go around and see some new scenery too. So it kind of, it adds you to your range and kind of keeps you motivated. It's fun to ride too. That's just, I find myself riding more because of that. I mean, I still do my regular bike rides, but I, the e-bike, I really enjoy getting out there on it. Absolutely. So you mentioned that you're looking at doing some rides next year in, in 2024. What are, are there any routes that you've got kind of locked in that you're doing or any ones that you got your eye on? Uh, yeah. So there's, I've kind of been looking around. I'm not settled on anything. I'm still doing the regular acoustic bike thing. So I still want to do regular bike tours. But one that kind of caught my eye is the Natchez Trace. Yeah. Because that's a flat out road. So it's sort of the perfect e-bike tour. I don't, I haven't scoped it out enough to check for for charging places but just being on a road and there's no stop signs and things like that it's just a wide open parkway so i think that would be a really perfect and very efficient route for for an e-bike tour for sure so that's one i've kind of looked down possibly i haven't really toured much in michigan which is close to me i've kind of looked at that doing some loops there but the not just trace really seems seems very inviting for e-bike for sure i love it if you are listening or watching this particular episode, it's episode 345, of course, of the Pedal Shift Project. Make sure you check out Brian's current video series that's up because he's literally rolling through Western New York as we are sitting here recording. So I'm looking forward to that episode on your way to Boston, right? Is that, was that the it was yes. Chicago to Boston or Indiana to Boston, basically? Yeah, Indiana to Boston. I, I really didn't want to ride through Chicago. So I started just a little bit Indiana. In, that was Indiana probably there. a wise choice when all was said yeah. and done. It's amazing. <laughs> well, I'm really enjoying this series. I mean, I have so much connection to a lot of the places that you're you're rolling through. So I like seeing that too. 
But as we have, I think everybody who's listening or watching has figured out, I am super intrigued by all of this. So I really, really am grateful for you to being on the show and talking about your experience and showing what we're capable of now in 2023. And I have a funny feeling that what you've got is going to be a more widely available to folks without your prodigious electronic skills down the line. <laughs> yeah, so sure. this is the future. I really do think that this is the future for some. Analog bikes are always going to be there, but this is this is what's going to be in the realm of possible for a lot of us in the near future. So Brian, thanks so much for joining and talking about it. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing this time. I appreciate it. If you are hearing this episode and you have not watched the interview, you are able to watch the interview over at the Pedal Shift YouTube channel. You can check out the link in the show notes. Please also, while you are on the U of Tubes or the Tubes of U or whatever, uh, go check out Brian's YouTube channel. You can just search for Biking Brian and it will bring you right there. Um, definitely, definitely check out the Indiana to Boston ride, which is currently uh, in the middle of the ride as we are releasing this particular episode. Um, um, he even name drops my hometown of Fairport, New York in day seven, which is kind of fun and cool. Um, definitely looking into more about e-biking as a way to open up a bicycle adventuring. I'm very curious what your thoughts are on the subject. I know it is, I don't know, is it controversial? It might be a little bit, but I would love to hear more about you because I am definitely going to be looking more into that as um, the years go on, whether it is for a little bit of a boost or maybe even doing the types of things that Brian's doing and really, really extending range. I think it's kind of exciting and hey, let's skate to where the puck's going to be. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community. Expanding into live shows and covering new tours, if you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options if you're not into the small monthly thing. Check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgatis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robber, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Aviles Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Jody Zoranen, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Bigel, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latoile Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Ronald Paroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messenger, David Grotke, Todd Grosbeck, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Lico, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCullum, John Hickman, Carl Presso, David Neves, Patty Louise, Terry Fitzgerald, Peter Steinmetz, Timothy Fitzpatrick, Michael Lazuski, Hank O'Donnell, David Zanoni, David Weil, Matthew Sponsell, Chad Reno, Spartan Dale, Carolyn Ferguson, Peggy Littlefield, Lauren Allen Smith, Eric Burns, Thomas Pearl, Darren McKibben, Richard Stewart, Dave Fletcher, Jack Smith, Luke Parkinson, Ryan Patterson, Sarus Faravar, John Gardner, Sam Scruggs, Dwight Pintinger, Connie Bowder, Rob Merrifeld, and thanks to all past and anonymous folks for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.